committed to developing the rating proficiency of Iowa's young people and pleased to help support the Iowa broadcast of Reading Rainbow. You'll find TV worth watching here on Iowa Public Television, a resource for Iowa's future. SCI Financial Group Incorporated, with offices in Cedar Rapids and Waterloo, is committed to the thorough discussion of today's current events and proud to help bring you the Iowa broadcast of the McLaughlin Group. From the nation's capital, the McLaughlin Group, an unrehearsed program presenting inside opinions and forecasts on major issues of the day. GE is proud to support the McLaughlin Group. GE, from plastics to financial services, we bring good things to life. Here's the moderator, John McLaughlin. Issue one, the yellow Ross of Texas. <laughs> Never forget Churchill's words, spoken at a very critical time during World War II. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. God bless you all. I believe it would be disruptive for us to continue our program since this program would obviously put it in the House of Representatives and be disruptive to the country. In the states, so therefore I will not become a candidate. H. Ross Perot's bombshell announcement that he would not seek the presidency sent shockwaves through the political world this week. The announcement came at the climax of the Democratic National Convention held in New York City. The two remaining presidential contenders, Bill Clinton and George Bush, raced to the phone to tell Mr. Perot how much he had done for America and how much they wanted the votes of his followers. I told him that I was deeply moved by his statement, very impressed by his campaign, and that I wanted to reach out to his supporters because I thought they wanted the same sort of change that I did. This morning, uh, after receiving the news, called Ross Perot, uh, congratulated him on the way he has energized so many people in the political process, uh, told him that, of course, I would welcome his support and the support of those who have gotten behind him. What's the impact on the presidential race of the Perot withdrawal, I ask you, Fred Bond? Well, the uh, uh, initial impact was one of the, an, an outburst of hypocrisy like <laughs> you rarely see, even among politicians in America. The, uh, and you neglected to call him the one that Paul Azan called him on CBS, the thin-skinned quitter, which I think sums it up. Ultimately, this is going to help Bush, uh, I believe, uh, although maybe not immediately, because it turns it into a traditional... Uh, Republican Democratic presidential race, right versus left, though not as ideologically polarized as 88, because Bush is less conservative and certainly Clinton is less liberal than uh, Mike Dukakis was, where Bush now uh, will try to lock up the South as his base and the Southwest and the mountain states, Florida and Texas, uh, he has an advantage. Now, Clinton has an advantage in California and, in the, uh, the, and all along the Pacific Coast and in the Northeast, and what do they fight over? They fight over the industrial heartland, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, Michigan. Those are the key states. Four states. What do you think, Ellen? Good counter. Okay, I think marginally it helps George Bush, but Ross Perot has done his job, and his job has helped Clinton. He's made the country realize how much they don't want to re-elect George Bush, and those voters are going to find it awfully difficult to go back to George Bush. And I think that uh, Bill Clinton has presented himself as a credible alternative, and I think the voters are going to take a look at him. I think he benefits in the long run, and he gets a chance to run against the Bush record without the diversion of Ross Perot, and there's lots to damn George Bush and his record. You mean they want change and Bush cannot deliver the change they want? Right, John. <laughs> what do you think, Chris? Well, By the so way, Chris, where did you get all your uh, insights into this? From that hot dog stand at the corner of 32nd and 7th <laughs> Avenue? <laughs> Look, it seems to me, first of all, let's go over Perot, because we've got to pick the bones of this guy just a little bit here. Uh, you know, politics is hardball. We all know that. And here's a guy doing just to the, to the political establishment exactly what he did to the Navy. He took a full scholarship, went to Annapolis, gets into the Navy, decides there's a lot of coarse people here. They speak in bad language. They're tough on each other. I think I, I want out. 
Here he is in politics. He goes in it. He beats the hell out of the establishment, blasts Washington, blasts the big cities, and then he comes in and he gets blasted back. So he says, I think I don't like being treated this way. I've never been treated like this in the boardroom or anybody. My serfs don't treat me this way. And he quits. He quits. Exactly what he said he wouldn't do. And I think it's an example that politics is a profession. And these, these amateurs that come into the business say, I think I'd like to be president tomorrow. Yeah. I got a lot of money. <laughs> I, look, as you, as you all know, I have been down on this guy from day one. I was even shocked by, the, by the, the cruelty and the cowardliness of this. I mean, this is like having a commander send his, uh, his, his troops out behind enemy lines and then, and then leave the scene of the battle. I mean, there, you cannot get lower than what this guy has done. And he lied about why he was doing it. You know, he's pretending that this is a gift to the country, that he's going to maintain the stability. Well, he knew from the beginning. Will Perot well, 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 endorse either Clinton or Bush Freddie? No, he won't endorse either one. But that is where, that is a problem uh, uh, for Bush. He doesn't uh, uh, hate Clinton. He does hate Bush. And he's going to have a platform uh, uh, for the entire campaign. If he wants to speak he out, he's going to on a television Ross show Perot, and criticize Ro Bush. Ross Perot blessed the new Democratic Party, said it was revitalized. I think that's Hardly a code blessing. word Who? blessing of the Democrats. I think he's opened whoever, the door to his supporters to support Clinton. Whoever, you think he was also supplying one of the reasons why he was quitting, namely that he could not defeat the Democrats. Yeah. You, you could say that Clinton's popularity uh, plus his selection of Gore drove down Perot 10 points in the this, polls. This was a he, rational and he was down to 20, and he didn't want to go between right. the sure. why? Why? Secondly, he probably had difficulty selecting a vice president of class, right. finding Almost one who would run with him. Right. He right. made a logical, a hard-headed business decision. And, you know, I do give him credit for bringing people into the process. He got their attention. They, they, watched, Clinton. Them. Oh. they watched Clinton the other night, and maybe they'll oh, stay come on. involved. No, no, I know no, they I don't. Here's what happened. Let finish. I know Let they finish. feel Let finish. like they're the victims of some giant I, scam, well, but now they're paying Eleanor. attention to politics, and I think that's positive. One-third of the, of the parole followers are Democrats, one-third Republicans, and one-third are independents, correct? Right. Roughly speaking. They're white, they're from the Sun Belt, and uh, they're from suburbia. They're, they're Republicans right. normally. And somewhat older, and a lot of them are, are ex reaganites all right? right? Let's say there are, well, there were 90, 90 million voters in 1988. Let's say that uh, Perot has 20% of them. Uh, that may shrink to 15. Let's say he's got 15 million voters out there that support him, right. followers. Right. Where are they going to go? Well, I think you have different varieties in different states. I think that the, per, the Paratistas in Florida may well go, go, go to George Bush, but I think California and Western states, I think they'll you play this. Yeah, you think people. it's fair to say that one-fourth will stay at home? Uh, no. Probably more than that. These people, more than that these people, no. A lot of them are people who don't always vote. And they're people, they haven't been energized by the process. These are people that, for once, believed in a and political leader, and he totally betrayed and them. And why? They're not going to rush and off with somebody and else. Why, and they, why, after the two of them go kissing his feet, you know, rushing to the phone to, to, uh, to lather the, him up, why would they trust any either of the other to answer two my, politicians? To answer my question, and I want you to right. comment on my answer to my own All question, right. one-fourth will stay at home, one-fourth will vote for either Clinton or Bush, and the other one-half will vote for either Clinton or Bush. <laughs> now, which way do you think it's going to go? You follow me? I don't, but let me see. One fourth stays at home, one fourth votes, votes for Clinton, and one half votes for Bush. You believe that? Uh, it's I all do. possible. Let me tell John, you, John. I believe it. The fact is that we you do believe the opposite. You know, I think the challenge to both George Bush and Bill Clinton is to keep these people involved. Right. And to stay home, you don't get any change at all. They want change. If this vote, if, if the, if, do we all agree that if the Perot vote had gone down to 15 points, that that would have been taken almost directly from George Bush. Absolutely. Right. No, 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 Yes, no, no, no. absolutely. Yeah. Down about the hardcore yeah. right no, no. wing. No, no. no. 15, when it becomes 15. soft, it goes to Clinton. I think yeah. when it drops to 10. But we got to get out. The exit question is as follows. The exit question is, come November, how is that vote going to split up? I think about, uh, about 60 to 65 percent to Bush. What do you think, Eleanor? Exact opposite. What do you think? Of the people that would have held on and stuck with Perot to the end, of that 15 points, most would have gone to Bush. This is a bad thing for Bush, what happened today. Yesterday, sorry, it, sorry, John. It all depends on how the campaign goes. These people are these people want change, but it's possible that George Bush could actually represent change. Oh, the, the typical time. indecision of this uh, <laughs> the, of, of this groping liberal. Uh, the answer ex -liberal, is John. ex liberal. Okay, the answer is one quarter stays at home, one quarter votes for Clinton, and one one half I think votes for Bush. The group returned from New York this week with assorted tales, as you can see. Well, it's been wonderfully friendly and calm here. Everybody's more or less been nice to each other, but not on FDR Drive as I was coming in from the airport. My cab was following a Bronco truck, was going too slow, flashed his lights, 
pulled around the side of him, and the guy in the truck has a baseball bat from swinging out the window yelling, you motherfucker, I'm gonna break your motherfucker neck. So then my cab driver reaches back with a chain, pulls the chain out the window, starts swinging it around and yelling back at him, I'll come on you, brother. That's the way it is in New York, Eleanor. I know you don't believe it, but it really is that way. You know, people say New York's a tough town, but a friend of mine left his wallet in a cab the other night. The next morning, he got a call from the cab driver saying, where can I drop off your wallet? And when he picked up his wallet, he found that the whole $400 he left in his wallet was still there. And he tried to give the cab driver a reward, and the cab driver said, sorry, I'm just doing this because I'm nice. That's the story here in New York. It's always nice to find that planning isn't everything. Hard as the Democrats have tried to script this convention, you just can't script real life. Bill Bradley thought he'd be the cheerleader at this convention, rousing the crowd into chants. He couldn't do it. Proves once again that white men can't jump. All the speakers were told they weren't to zing Ross Perot. Zell Miller did. Got the biggest cheers of the night. And I helped my daughter get a job here at the convention at CNN. I was afraid she'd hate it. Turned out she loved every moment. Issue 2, The Comeback Kid. Of all the things George Bush has ever said that I disagree with, perhaps the thing that bothers me most is how he derides and degrades the American tradition of seeing and seeking a better future. He mocks it as the vision thing. But just remember what the scripture says. Where there is no vision, the people perish. The jubilant Democratic faithful cheered Bill Clinton Thursday night with thundering ovations that echoed and re-echoed throughout New York's Madison Square Garden. Governor Clinton's acceptance speech was the culmination of the four-day Democratic National Convention, a convention that was perfectly orchestrated to produce unity in the center. Whatever disunity existed, it was papered over. Pennsylvania Governor Casey, an ardent pro-lifer, was denied a platform appearance which he described as a gag ruling. The wayward Jerry Brown was finally allowed to address the convention. Brown made no mention of Clinton, neither endorsing nor attacking him. The Democratic Congress was almost totally excluded from the platform, notably Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell and House Speaker Tom Foley. The image of Clinton as an outsider was undisturbed by any association with Washington incumbents. But the most important feature of this convention was the Democratic Party's makeover of the party's own image. Democrats are no longer leftist, no longer liberal. They are now ma mainstream, they are now centrist. Polls taken on Thursday after Ross Perot's withdrawal announcement show that it probably is working. A 23-point bounce for Clinton. Clinton is at 56%, Bush 33%. At this time four years ago, Michael Dukakis enjoyed a 17-point convention bounce. Did the Democratic National Convention accomplish its central purpose, namely to reorient the public perception of the Democratic Party so that Democrats are no longer seen as liberal left, but center mainstream? And is this seismic shift real, or is it cosmetic? Eleanor Cliff. Well, tune into the Republican convention in August. They'll try to pretend that it's not real. But the Democratic Party has shifted, and so is the country. Uh, only Jerry Brown is out there championing big labor. And on issues like abortion rights and family leave, the Democrats are where the country is, and that's right in the middle. And I thought Bill Clinton staged some masterful preemptive strikes in his speech. Family values, leading uh, the hall in the Pledge of Allegiance, on his record in Arkansas, on uh, a number of issues, welfare reform, he really staked out his turf for November. And on taxes, if the, if the Republicans try to label him as a big taxer, that's a fight he can handle. He wants to tax people who make over $200,000 a year. And I think most people in this country would go along Christopher. with that. Christopher. One of the reasons why Bill Clinton is basically bringing back the Democratic fold away from Perot, and I think to some extent away from the independents, the old Reagan Democrats back, is because he really has accomplished the transition to the Democratic Party that Jimmy Carter attempted back in the 1970s. He has clearly moved the party against the idea of more is better. He's moved them into the direction of efficiency, of accountability. 
I've never heard Democrats look, talk like look, this guy. He talks about runaway fathers and welfare abuse yeah, the way yeah, the yeah. old look, conservatives he's clearly used to not, do. He is clearly not Walter Mondale or uh, George McGovern, that's for sure. There is a lot of big government in, in the Clinton plan and a lot of liberalism on the floor of the convention. But uh, the best line I've heard on all this is by Will Marshall of the Progressive Policy Institute, who said that, this, that the Democratic Party is like a bus that's gotten a new driver. And the people who are in the bus don't like the direction that they're being taken into, but all they can do is squat. Well, that's See, way I, I, I mean, that's true. I mean, the Democrats are still liberals. Clinton himself is a, a, a moderate and a liberal, and the strategy is to campaign as a moderate. Uh, hey, I think that's hey, a... Hey, 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 Bill Clinton hey, hey, was the that's chairman the same, of the Democratic yeah, Leadership, Leadership Council. Council and they won. Gaul was one of the ace members of the council. How can you I say that he's, he's liberal? Was he liberal I towards he's partly moderate. Soldier? Well, Was he at, liberal towards any look, of the... Look at his economic plan. That is the liberal side. He had, uh, there are two oh, sides to him. There's on, the moderate side Ed. and the liberal side. Here's the problem with his speech. Not only that it went on too long, uh, over 50 53 minutes, and people, minutes. And people were yawning because it went on so long. He had an opportunity. It wasn't a bad speech, but he had an opportunity to reach out to the middle and grab the Perot vote and Reagan Democrats, and I'm afraid he didn't achieve it in that speech. He may yet end the abortion issue. Contrary to what Eleanor says, abortion on demand is not the American position. Abortion he should on have demand let Governor is not Case, Bill Clinton's position He should have let Governor either, Casey Fred speak Barnes. because the key states, remember, John, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, and Illinois are states where the okay. where the political process is dominated by ethnic right. right. who are pro-life. I, I, really, I really I really resent this sloganeering, this uh, abortion on demand. You do. When I think Bill Clinton said that he wants abortion to be safe, legal, and rare, and is interested in programs that would uh, reduce the number of abortions in this country. And if it, you know, liberals don't have to be excommunicated from the party in order to uh, 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 adjust Look, the policy. Let me and get in here. This party let me has just make a point. The, the Democrats have come a long way on the economic issues. They're clearly now a centrist political party in economic issues. You're right in a way. I mean, I think most of the country is clearly pro pro choice when it comes down to it. But I think the Democratic Party still sends a cultural message that guys like Bob Casey aren't in the party. Right. That if your name's O'Brien or your name's Vitaly, you really don't. You're not really a Democrat. Mario they send that message Cuomo over. I'm telling you, that podium, Cuomo, and I Cuomo think, is extreme on the position of abortion. I think the Vitalys and the O'Sullivans are exactly where Mario you think Cuomo, Cuomo is, is on that issue. Most Catholics on cultural issues. I think most Catholics are not, not are not doctrinaire on the issue of it's abortion. It's not. Who's saying doctrinaire? We got to get out. We got to move I'm talking about the cultural question. The problem with Democratic. Party is I it panders to every economic and social group except Catholics. Let's get out. Let's, let's rate. Let's rate. I was at it. <laughs> uh, let's rate uh, Clinton and, and his performance at uh, his acceptance speech. What do you want to assign him on a on the basis of A to F? I'd give him a C. Too long and uh, missed the opportunity. Eleanor? I'd give him an A. He he got the job done. What do you give him? Uh, it was not well written. It had no music. It had no rhythm and no cadence. It was, was clearly it a committee a, job. I mean, I sometimes think that Bill, that uh, Mario Cuomo is the uh, Larry Bird of American politics because he's the he's the only white guy who can give a speech. You give, I, you I'm give, telling you, you give, we all give uh, Mario an A plus. A plus yeah. for okay. Mario. I'd give about a B to Clinton. A B to Clinton. Yeah, I give him a B too. For a exactly B, a B to Clinton reason. is good. Who else stands out that you want to mention here? Single out. Jesse is it Barbara Robert, Jordan? Yeah. Jesse Jackson? Is it uh, Zell Miller? Uh, Paul Songus? Bill Brown? Jerry Brown yeah. gets a failing grade. Who does? Jerry Brown gets a failing grade. All right, grade. Jerry Brown gets a failing yeah. grade. Yeah. I think we all. Barbara Jordan was was spoke too long, but she she was didactic but she had the strongest message of anyone there saying things that you never hear at a Democratic right. convention. Now, she's someone who really has come to the Senate. And to counter, now, to counter the, Fred Barnes, Bill Bradley gave a speech that said a lot of classy things, and he spoke out on race and said <laughs> things we all What do you think hear. about Bradley's speech? It, it was the worst speech I've ever heard him give. Bad, Bradley bombed. Do you think Bradley bombed? He didn't do as well as he should have. Bradley bombed? See. Bad, Brad, it looks like Bradley bombed on. Sorry, I but I want to get back to I Barbara disagree. Jordan crystallized best the movement within the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. which appears to be far more than cosmetic. Why not change, she said, from a party with a reputation of tax and spend to one of investment and growth? Right. The American electorate must be persuaded to trust us, the Democrats, to govern again. Okay, uh, Jackson, shall we get out? So let's get, let's get out. Uh, based on the convention's overall impact on Clinton's election pursuit, how do you grade this convention? A to F. Well, compared to what Democrats usually do, this is the best, so I'd have to give it an A. That's a great improvement this for them. This is a superlative convention, and he just needs to keep the pressure on, which he's doing on his bus trip, which even reporters can afford. What do you give this convention? You give day. it an A? A, and the yes. numbers prove it. He's picking up all the pro this you week. You give him an A? A. The answer is A+. plus. Okay. Now, here's my New York Minute. This Democratic National Convention marks the return to civility. The Democrats have sobered up. Both in their style, this is a very well-organized body, 
very unified, and in their thinking, they moved mainstream, centrist. They moved away from the leftist programs and policies of the past that have cost them the White House for the last 20 out of 24 years. It's a big story. It's a seismic shift. Come November, the American people will decide who wins on the basis of one or two principles. Either the devil I know is better than the devil I don't know, in which case Bush will win, or May West principle, when I am given the choice between two evils, I always pick the one I have not tried before, in which case Bill Clinton will win. It remains to be seen which principle will dominate. This has been a real high for the Democrats. They're showcasing all their talent from the new ticket to three dozen women running for the House and Senate. In fact, I picked John up a little gift, a pair of one-size-fits-all Barbara Boxer shorts. Hope you like them, John. And uh, I think women are going to deliver the White House for the Democrats. Uh, Hillary Clinton is meeting with lots of people. Bring your own home-baked cookies. This is the new party, traditional, mainstream progressive. We don't say liberal anymore. Ellen, I'll treasure those. <laughs> Issue three, hook, line, and baker. It's not catching the fish. It's being out there in nature with nature all around you. President Bush went fishing this week with Secretary of State James Baker at Baker's Ranch in Boulder, Wyoming. Besides rest and relaxation, Mr. Bush was seeking advice from his trusted friend on how to get the Bush re-election campaign moving. In 1988, Baker ran Bush's winning presidential bid. Many Republicans are hoping that he will take a leave of absence as Secretary of State and do it again. Question. With the Republican convention just four short weeks away, what must Republican candidate Bush do to revitalize his presidential re-election bid. I ask you, Morton Kondracki. He has that's to... Kondracki spelled with an E, by the way. He, that's right. He has to answer the simple question, what's it all about, Georgie? You know, he's got to explain what he has been doing for the last four years and what he intends to do in the next four years and put it together in some coherent uh, package. Uh, now, he... Do you think he's got to bring Baker on board? I do, I do. I mean, somebody's got to organize this thing so that the message gets out clearly and is systematically maintained. Now, Bill Clinton stole from a George Bush speech the line, if we can change the world, we can change America. It was a, it's a wonderful line. George Bush had something to do with changing the world, and it does have something to do with, with changing America. It frees up all this money from the Cold War spending that we used to do, and, and George Bush has a great opportunity to, to explain himself, but he hasn't done it Fred, yet. Fred, well, the first thing is he needs a little electroshock therapy to come alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would help. But secondly, to bring in Jim Baker as economic czar for this reason. If Bush just comes out and says, hey, I'm for low taxes and I'm going to cut spending, who's going to believe him after he uh, broke his pledge from 1988? So what he does is this. He brings back Jim Baker as economic czar and says, look, here's my new plan. Here's the guy who's going to push it through. He's going to stay that in my second term. Uh, Jim Baker, the strongest guy in my regime, my best friend, he will push through this economic plan. I'll put Dick Cheney as at, at, at Secretary of State and maybe Jack Kemp at the Treasury Department. Uh, that leads over the problem the question, is who's that the even, campaign? If, even if he does all this, I don't know how credible it is because I mean I don't think the country's going to buy the notion that first he fixed the world and now okay he's going to turn his attention homeward for the next four years. I think it's a, it's it's too late. And what he needs is an energy transplant. I mean George Bush looks a lot younger than he is, but he's acting like a, a, a senior citizen. And the message that the Clinton-Gore ticket delivers is not so much the age difference, but energy. Any chance that quail will be dumped? No. No? Well, uh, there's a chance, but it's, a, it's, it's out of, out of Any sight. Any chance that Baker might be put in to take Quayle's place. Vice well, that's President. a constitutional problem because you've got two two yeah. candidates from the same state in the electoral college. No, Baker. Those no, 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 no. Baker's a resident of Wyoming. Right. Has he changed his registration? Changed yeah, yeah, his registration. Yeah, yeah. When did he you do can that? use that in your column if you want. Why John, I said he didn't. He denied it. When I, when I reported it two years ago, he said he hadn't done it. The uh, as economic two years is two years. John, as what? economic czar, Jim Baker would also be running the campaign. We sat around here last week talking about how vice presidents don't matter. They matter a lot. I think Al Gore is responsible for, for 15 points of the lead that Bill Clinton has <laughs> gotten. Agree. This is a different kind of year, <laughs> I and I think Dan Quayle is a negative, and they may conclude out of a desperate, an act of desperation, they could dump him. They are Bringing not... Bringing Baker look, aboard no, is an act of desperation. No, why not There's reason why they won't do it. They need Quayle to shore up their conservative base.
<laughs> predictions, Fred. I still say liberal. Uh, the Republicans will make a huge effort to get the endorsement of Ed Rollins, and I think they'll succeed. Who was fired, by the way? Didn't didn't resign. No, he, no, he resigned. Right. No, he, he was fired. Wait and see. The story will break. Emily's <laughs> Emily's list, which funds pro-choice women candidates, will raise five million dollars for women this year, making it the largest funder of political campaigns, surpassing the Realtors Association. Chris. Uh, Dan Quayle will survive on the Republican ticket this year, but they will try to make him invisible. This is the new official bumper sticker of the Republican ticket this year. Bush in big, bold, white letters, and this is the running mate. I can't read the running mate. That's what they want you to <laughs> not read. not even eligible. They were hoping that you could. Does they quail that's, that's, the idea, oh, that's the idea, John. Oh, that's the idea. Isn't that clever, John? Yitzhak Rabin will declare that there will be no more political settlements in uh, in the West Bank for the for the foreseeable future, and even security settlements will be will be suspended. Therefore, when Yitzhak Rabin comes to Kenny Bunkport in August before the Republican convention, George Bush will lift the the ban on loan guarantees. Jesse Helms will resign his seat in the United States Senate after the election, and the incumbent governor will award it to Jim Gardner who will not succeed in winning his uh, place as governor. Uh, many observers are calling 1992 the year of the woman, so here are some predictions. Uh, change that. Female intuitions from the Democratic Convention this week. Tom McLaughlin, I got all sorts of predictions. Your days are over. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> the, the women are coming. <laughs> this ticket's going to win with women. They're going to be pulled in by their skirt tails. And you're going to have a tsunami of women washing into Washington next year. And you're going to have to learn to be more bicultural. Okay, my name is Bianca Dagger, and I predict that Clinton and Gore are going to be the winners of the presidents and vice presidency of the United States. I predict that next year at about this time, I will be uh, sitting before the Senate Judiciary Committee introducing Mario Cuomo to my colleagues in the Senate for confirmation to the Supreme Court. Next week, Barcelona, 92, the Summer Olympics. Let the games begin. Bye-bye. The McLaughlin Group. GE is proud to support the McLaughlin Group. GE, from plastics to financial services, we bring good things to life. For transcripts, send $5 to Federal News Service, 620 National Press Building, Washington, D.C., 20045. Specify program date. To obtain a free McLaughlin Group Viewer's Guide, write Viewer's Guide, Box 786, Madison Square Station, New York, New York, 10159. Topics are selected by Mr. McLaughlin, and the opinions expressed are solely those of the participants. SCI Financial Group Incorporated, with offices in Cedar Rapids and Waterloo, is committed to the thorough discussion of today's current events and proud to help bring you the Iowa broadcast of the McLaughlin Group. You are viewing Iowa Public Television. Tonight, explore nature and look at life in Iowa. Enjoy Ann Murray and the Boston Pops and begin a powerful portrait of an extraordinary marriage. I fitted out three vessels, well supplied, and with many seamen. I was to go by way of the west, whence until today, we do not know with certainty that anyone has passed. 500 years after Columbus set sail, we follow in his wake. Columbus and the age of discovery. The story of what made us who we are. Returning Monday at 7. In less than a century, the vast ecosystem known as the Great Plains may have reached the point of no return. We have to look at the whole. We, we cannot look at soil erosion, at population, at food production, at insects, at, at weeds as separate issues. They're all part of the same issue. 
Jane Fonda hosts Battle for the Great Plains, another alert on the environmental crisis from the National Audubon Society. Tune in to Iowa Public Television Tuesday at 8.